Good evening. Uh, welcome to Ministry Academy. Uh, this is Church History. My name is Mike. Uh, and, and tonight we're not going to have uh, two classes. We're, we're going to have Church History. Uh, the five solas uh, will not be this evening. Uh, that will be next week uh, on Tuesday. Uh, I will not be here next week on Tuesday, so it won't be Church History. So uh, the five solas will not be tonight and Church History will not be next Tuesday. And then we'll be back on our regular schedule. So uh, some of this is going to be review. I think I've already talked about some of these points already on the previous class. Uh, so just bear with us. Review is good, um, especially when you're doing history because uh, repetition just works. So uh, right now we're, we're in talking about the beginnings of the new church. We have, we have talked about how, the, uh, how the, the Jewish nation was really the first church and actually before even the Jewish nation. Um, it was it was Adam and Eve in the garden when they were walking with God. That was the first church. So now what we're looking at is the new church. Uh, and when I say new church, we're talking about uh, not the Hebrew church, but the church after after Jesus. So when we start talking about that, we talk about well, how did Jesus change the church? What changed for us as Christians that that the Jewish people didn't recognize? And and here's some of the things. Uh, but you have to understand first of all what kind of world that Jesus came into. Uh, when he was here, when he was doing his ministry on earth. And so up on the screen, we have the days of Jesus. Number one, we had Roman rule. Uh, what that meant was uh, the Romans had control of everything. They were levying the taxes, but they were also bringing in uh, police. They were bringing in roads. They were bringing in water. Uh, they were bringing in peace. So even though they were occupied by a foreign nation, uh, Israel actually had a lot of benefits to being under Roman rule. And that comes into play as we go further into talking about what was going on in Jerusalem during Jesus' time, in Israel during Jesus' time. The second thing we, we know is that the culture was Hellenistic Greek. Uh, and, and see, Alexander the Great had built an empire. He went all the way out through the world and built one of the largest empires ever. Uh, and after that empire uh, basically fell, uh, the Medo-Persians came. Uh, they, they were part of it too, but then the Romans came. So... The Greeks, as these, these, these empires grew and then receded, they left something of, this, of themselves behind. So a lot of the philosophy, a lot of the logic, the language uh, was all Hellenistic uh, Greek. And Jesus was in, in that, that, uh, that culture. Thirdly, uh, the, the, the uh, culture was highly legalistic. Uh, what that means is they had rules for basically just about everything. And, and the, the primary players in the legalism were two guys, two groups called the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were the people, they were the lawyers of the day. Uh, they knew the law inside and out. If you were asking them, what can I do, what I can I not do, what's legal under the Jewish law and what isn't, the scribes were the guys to go to. They knew it all. Uh, the next group of people are the Pharisees. And the Pharisees knew the law almost as good as the scribes. And some of them may, do, may have known it as good as they may have been scribes themselves. Pharisees had one other part to their to their knowledge, and that was the rabbinic tradition. What we call the rabbinic tradition or the, the holy tradition. That's the that's the rules and regulations that were built around the actual Jewish law. And and one of the terms that's used to describe that is a thing called the hedge about the law. And, and what that was, it was rules to help you make sure you didn't break the rules. Uh, we had a, a, a get together one time with a, a pastor down. In Columbus, his name was Larry Biggers. And Larry, one of the things he cannot stand is legalism in the church. And uh, Larry said, you know, I just fight it all the time. What, what do you do to keep legalism from happening in your church? And I said, oh, we don't have any problems with legalism in our church. He said, really? I said, yes. We made rules to keep that from happening. And I thought Larry was going to pass out right there. He thought I was serious. Uh, but the truth of it is, is, is that's kind of what the, the, the hedge about the law is like. It's like making rules to make sure you don't break the rules. And they were really complicated. Uh, it was really hard to live your life um, in, the, in the, the Jewish uh, community and be able to meet all the expectations of all the, the people. Now, I will say this. The scribes and the Pharisees get a, lot, a really bad rap in the New Testament. Uh, and a lot of the scribes and Pharisees deserve to get the rebuking that they got. However, there is nothing wrong with knowing all the law and obeying all the law. There is nothing wrong with knowing all the traditions that, that go along with it, all the extra rules and going along with them. Uh, that's actually a good thing, uh, or it can be. 
problem is, is when you start thinking that you're all that in a bag of donuts because you could keep all the rules. That was the problem. So a lot of what Jesus taught um, pulled down those strongholds of the arrogance and the confidence that people had in their ability to be righteous. Um, that was the problem. Righteousness centered on man's own actions, not righteousness centered on what God is doing inside. Of you. So that was a problem with the scribes and the Pharisees. The other point um, is uh, Jesus' view of the religious leaders. I kind of gave a little hint of that away. Um, he looked at them in several ways. Number one, they tended to be very proud. They were, they were prideful of the fact of how good they were. Uh, secondly, is they were obeying the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. In other words, there were reasons why the rules were written to do certain things. And the, the scribes and the Pharisees, a lot of them, were obeying every letter of the law, but the whole reason behind the law had, was, was lost on them. They weren't obeying that. Um, and we'll explain that a little bit further here in a minute. Uh, C, they were abusive of the people they were supposed to serve. Uh, so they were supposed to be serving people. But what they were really doing was basically being dictators over the people and not actually serving them. Um, and all this kind of culminated, one of, the, one of the, the best ways to see how this culminated, well, there's, there's two ways. But one of those ways was in the cleansing of the temple. See, Jesus, after he came in, the triumphal entry, and he, he weeps for Jerusalem, he goes into the temple, and he, and he sees all the money changing going on. Now, I'll give you a little context for that. See, that's part of the church that was going on right then. There were the sacrifices and the festivals that they had to observe, and there were the taxes they had to pay, and they had to pay them in certain ways, and they had to do the, the sacrifices in certain ways. There were only certain kind of animals you could get. And, and what people were doing in the courtyard is basically, it's kind of like when a, a hurricane comes in, and all of a sudden, plywood and generators and, and bottled water gets really expensive, or a pandemic comes and you can't find toilet paper. Um, what happens is people make a run on things, and then the people that have the things to sell start raising the prices higher and higher and higher. But what was happening in the temple is the people that were selling the animals and making the exchanges for the, the money to be able to pay the temple taxes and the right kind of coins, they were charging people extra money to get done what they had to get done. They were taking advantage of people because they had to do it this particular way, which that's free, free market. I mean, once you find out that someone needs to buy this thing, um, all of a sudden, they can charge about whatever they want. And that's what was happening. So Jesus goes in and says, I think it was in, in the account of Mark, where he said it sat down and he took cords and he wound them into a, a whip. And he drove the animals out, right? And I always ask people, where did he get the cords from? Well, the cords came from the animals that were being led into the temple. So the, a lot of times I tell people our own whipping or the, the cords for our whips, we bring ourselves that God can weave into a whip to punish us with. So they got punished with their own, their own leashes that came in. But Jesus was so mad, um, but righteously so. I mean, it's a good anger. He drove the animals out, right? They could go get their animals again. He didn't destroy their commerce. He just moved them out of the temple. Uh, he, he, he overturned the, the tables where the money was, so they had to pick up all their money. The money wasn't gone. It was still there. And he told the people that had the, the, the birds, he didn't knock those cages over and set them free. He said, get these out of here. You, you have turned my father's house in, in, into a, basically a house of, of commerce. So what had happened, what Jesus was looking at is they stopped really giving importance to the person they were worshiping. And they put all their importance on the rules and regulations that were supposed to honor the person they were supposed to worship. And they stopped. They, they, they gave a lot of, um, uh, I guess, prideful arrogance towards what was built. Out in the courtyards, they were doing commerce. But the temple itself, they almost worshipped the building, but they stopped worshipping or loving the person that the building was for. The whole point of church isn't a building or uh, numbers or people or songs or music or lights or any of that kind of stuff. It's, it's coming back into union with God. Church is all about us coming back into the presence of God, into his sanctuary, and having communion. Um, so, uh, the cleansing of the temple was a good illustration of how Jesus looked at the scribes and the Pharisees. They had lost their first love, is another way to put it. They had stopped loving the person that they were supposed to love in the, in the, in the, the exercise of their religion, and they were all about all the outward trappings of their religion. Um, the Sanhedrin is another thing to, to know about. Let's go to that next slide. 
the Sanhedrin. Um, yeah, it's not going to do a full. Excuse me. Technology is great until it isn't great. The Sanhedrin. Um, they were not priests. They were kind of like scribes, uh, but they were the governing body um, in Israel at the time. So they were the ones that decided cases. They're the ones that heard grievances and made decisions. They were also uh, um, they were also condemned by Jesus. Jesus looked at them and said, "Hey, listen, you guys are like whitewashed sepulchers, right? All the outside is nice and clean and impressive, but inside there's there's rotten bones." And all this comes down to a a head. Um, Um, when Jesus was being tried by the uh, by the Sanhedrin, uh, they found him guilty, and they took him to uh, they took him to Caesar or they took him to Pontius Pilate, and he's sitting in the courtyard, and, and Pilate's doing his best to get out of the, the dirty business of sacrificing or killing or executing uh, Jesus. He doesn't want to do it. He wants to let him go. Pilate is talking in his ear, saying, "Hey, this guy is important. You don't need to get rid of him. This is a bad idea." And Pilate's looking for a way out. And Pilate says something to the courtyard of all the Jews that were in that courtyard. He said, do you want me to kill your king? And, and they had a bunch of different ways they could respond. And a lot of the people that were out in that, that, that mass of people were people from the Sanhedrin. They could have said, uh, we don't want this king. We want a king, David. And here's a guy who's related to David. Or we don't want this guy. We want somebody else. Or better yet. They could say, we have no king but God. That would have been a great thing to say. They could have said, we already have a king. Our king is Herod. Herod, they didn't want him as a king, though, because he was a he was a, uh, a Samaritan, basically. He was half Jewish and half not Jewish. So they didn't like Herod. So, But what they did pick, which is astounding, they said, we have no king but Caesar, which is amazing, because they could have picked an actual Jewish person for the could have picked God, which was even better. They could have picked a Jewish person for their king. They could have picked a half Jew for their king, who's already in a palace and was acting as king. But the person that they chose was a person who was the the governing uh, headstone, I guess, or the, the head guy over the country that was occupying Israel at the time, and who also was was basically worshipped like a god man um, throughout all the areas where they had their kingdom. So they, they, not only did they not pick a Jewish person, not only did they not pick God, but they picked a pagan man who was definitely not a Christian and who um, basically was, was set up as a, as a man-God. Um, there, there's a lot of different ways of, of looking at that. Um, my personal opinion, very likely, is that when they said we have no king but Caesar, at that point the, the fate of the, of the Jewish nation was sealed. Uh, at that point there, there was no real coming back from the state. And, and I'm not saying the nation of Israel is gone. What I'm saying is whatever was going to happen to Jesus, or whatever was going to happen afterward with the fall of Jerusalem was, was already sealed by saying we have no king but Caesar because they made themselves just like the world, which is what, when you go back to Samuel, uh, they said we would like to have a king like all the other nations. Uh, so what they did, they gave up their uniqueness as the, uh, the nation of God. Uh, next slide. The changes of Jesus, Jesus time. Um, probably the biggest change that happened uh, because of Jesus was the Sabbath. Uh, we, we have to understand something about what the Sabbath is. Uh, it, it's amazing to me when we're talking about uh, what kind of rules and regulations we're still under, um, that we know that we're not supposed to kill anybody. We know, we know we're not supposed to lie or envy or, or uh, we're supposed to honor our mother and father. We're not supposed to... Um, commit adultery, right? We're not supposed to do all those things. We're supposed to love the Lord our God and none other. We're not supposed to have idols. We're not supposed to use the Lord's name in vain. We, we get all those, but it gets to this one where it says, six days will you work, and on the seventh day you'll rest and have a Sabbath. And all of a sudden, uh, a lot of the Christian church says, well, we don't need to do that anymore because Jesus is our Sabbath. Well, I get that he's our rest. That's true. But I, I don't think that anywhere in the Old Testament or the New Testament it says that all of the, uh, the Ten Commandments are now void because Jesus showed up. We still can't kill anybody. <laughs> I, I hope we just, uh, we, we still don't commit adultery. But there's this, this call to us to have a rest. And, and the, the point of this is this. I don't think it matters what day of the week you take as a rest. But I think God said you were designed to work six and rest one. And that rest isn't just sitting around and watching TV. 
that rest is to come into communion back with God and allow him to commune with you, for you to listen to him and for him to be there with you and for you to be in his presence. That's what the Sabbath is about. It's about coming into God's presence. And one of the most striking things that Jesus does during his ministry is how many times he healed people on the Sabbath. And one of the most striking ones of this was when a woman was bent over. She was oppressed by a spirit, and it had her bent over. And uh, he healed her, and they said, what are you doing? It's the Sabbath. And he said, listen, if, if you had an, an ox and it had fallen down in a pit, you would pull it out. You would take care of it. And, she, and he said, and this, this woman is not an oxen. This woman is not a cow. This woman is a human being created in the image of God. And she has been bound, not by falling in a pit, but she's been bound by Satan himself. And the Sabbath is exactly the day that we ought to be doing something like setting her free from her bondage. That's, that's what Jesus brought is he brought back into the idea, not just the letter of the law uh, that we got from the Old Testament and the New Testament, but he brought in uh, the spirit of the law because that's the spirit of the Sabbath, to go ahead and set the captives free, to go ahead and feed the hungry, to clothe the naked. Uh, and he says, and then your light will shine forth in the world. That's from Isaiah. Uh, the, the whole idea of a Sabbath isn't one of just resting and, and, and relaxing. It's coming back into communion with God and bringing others into communion with God as well. Whether that means you're healing them or you're teaching them, it doesn't really matter. So Jesus changed the Sabbath because he said, let's look at the spirit of it. Let's not look at what the rules and regulations are. He changed some of the stuff on cleanliness. Because everyone was so uptight about what the cleanliness was on the outside, they really didn't pay attention a whole lot to what the cleanliness was like on the inside. Uh, one of the, the interesting ways, if you want to look at it this way, is the marriage feast at Cana, when Jesus, when Jesus changed the, um, the water into wine. They, they get to a, a marriage feast, and the wine is flowing free, and they run out of all the good stuff, they run out of all the medium stuff, then they run out of all the bad stuff, and Jesus' mom comes to him and says, they're out of wine. And she knows that he can fix it. And uh, at first he doesn't want to. But then he says, bring the, the stone jars in. Those stone jars that were there at that marriage feast, they were for people to come in and, and dip water out of or put their hands in and wash themselves. It was ceremonial water for getting clean. And Jesus takes the ceremonial water for getting clean, and he changes that into wine. And I, I tell people, I know there's, there's debate about alcohol, and whether it's it's right or wrong or, or whatever, but I'm I'm, I'm just going to tell you, if you study the history of Israel, uh, Jesus didn't change the water into grape juice. Jesus changed the water into wine, and there's there's a real teaching involved in in the, the changing of water into wine. And this is what it is. Jesus' ministry is all about saying, I don't care about the cleanliness on the outside of the body. I care about what changes on the inside. Of the body. So Jesus specifically takes water that's designed to make you outwardly clean, and he turns it into wine, which when you drink it, changes you from the inside out. Now, I'm not advocating going out and drinking a bunch of wine. But I'm saying this, that if you take a drink of wine, it changes how you act. It changes how you feel. It changes how you, how you think. It changes who you are. And for many people, that's a really bad thing. Uh, but the, the key here isn't the fact that you're drinking wine. It's something that changes you from the inside out. Uh, Jesus' idea of cleanliness is not to get clean on the outside, but to get clean on the inside, and then the outside will take care of itself. Uh, which, once again, is getting back to the whole concept of the spirit of the law, is not the uh, not the letter. The third thing is the temple sanctity. I think Jesus was looking forward to what was going to happen when he was crucified. When he died, the temple veil was torn from top to bottom. The Holy of Holies was open. And I believe at that moment when that, that opening was made into the Holy of Holies, the temple became obsolete. There was absolutely no reason for the temple anymore. Because Jesus was saying the temple was required because of our sinfulness. And through his death, he took our sin on him. The temple is no longer needed. The sacrifices are no longer needed. Uh, everything about the temple, all its holiness and everything like that, is all gone. Uh, there is no such thing as a, as a temple, I believe, in Jesus' ministry. He says, I'm going to tear the temple down. It's his own body and rebuild it in three days. The Jews were angry because they said it took many, many years to build the temple. You can't do that. And Jesus said, I'm not really even talking about the temple because it just doesn't matter. So Jesus looked at the temple sanctity and said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to have zeal for my father's house because of what's going on in his name. But the building itself really just doesn't matter. 
um, what, Je what, the, what Jesus kept the same. Number one, he kept the uh, Jewish law the same. Now you'll say, well, you've just been talking, saying how Jesus changed the law, how he doesn't do it anymore. Except for the fact that Jesus said this. He said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And as, as, as long as there's an earth, not one jot, not one dot, not, not one tittle is going to go away from this law until everything is accomplished. Well, what Jesus did when he said, when he said I'm going to fulfill the law, is, is basically take all the law and, and satisfy it in his one life, his one death, and his one resurrection. I, I tell people that one of the ways we see how the law was fulfilled is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says this, For our sake, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might have the righteousness of God. And what that means is that all of our all of our sin, all of our nastiness, all the things that are wrong with us, Jesus said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make you a deal. You give me all your bad stuff. And honestly, that's all you really have is bad stuff. So you give me everything that's inside you. And in return, what I'm going to do once I have everything that's inside you is I'm going to take everything that's inside me and I'm going to give it to you. We're going to trade insides, basically. So when, when Jesus did that, he said, this is the big word, and I talked about this last night at, at New Birth Ministries out in your valley. Um, it's the imputation. So our sins were imputed to Christ. Our sins and our depravity was given to Christ, and he carried it in him. And his righteousness was, was taken out of him and put in us. So in, in, in exchange for our nastiness, we got all of his wonderfulness, basically. The Jewish law is fulfilled in Christ. Because that's what Jesus did. He went to he went to the place of the dead, bearing all of our sins and fulfilled the law. Um, he also satisfied the Jews first. It's you know if you go all through the New Testament, all the time it's always they go to the Jewish people first, and then the Gentiles. So the Jewish people first, and then the Gentiles. Jesus is always going to the Jewish people, but he also went to the Gentiles. You know who the very first missionary to the world was? It was a woman who was living with her fifth. Her fifth husband, who she hadn't married, whose name we don't know, who is a Samaritan, and he talked to her one on one at a well, and then she went off and started telling people all about Jesus. So the very first missionary, the very first evangelist, was a woman who was half Jew, who was an adulteress. If that gives you any idea about how God is working, how Jesus works, that's it. But he went to the Jews first. Even she was a Samaritan, half Jew. But always it started with the Jews first and then the Gentiles. The Gentiles weren't excluded. He talked to the Roman centurions. He talked to the to the all, all the people that were in Jerusalem. He didn't exclude them, but he always went to the Jewish people first. The third thing that he kept were the feasts. So we want to talk about the feasts. Because now what we're getting into, because we're alluding to it, uh, we're getting into talking about the time after Jesus was dead, uh, buried and resurrected, uh, that we're talking about coming into the apostolic age. Um, now, an apostle, literally, what apostle means is sent. Those are just people who are sent. So Jesus came, had his ministry. The disciples were the apostles, and they were sent out to the world to, to, to distribute the gospel, the good news of Christ. And they made mentors of people who then became apostles. And they go out into the world and spread the good news of Christ. And they, in turn, make disciples and mentor people. And they went out into the world and spread and spread and spread. Um, there are some people that say that there are no more apostles because the definition of an apostle is someone who actually physically met Christ and was, was trained by Christ. But that's not the word, what the word means. The word literally, mean, literally means sent. So everyone who is sent, everyone who has been mentored, everyone who has been equipped uh, and, and is going out like a pioneer, and that's what we call this, we're part of the pioneer network, um, they are apostles. They're the sent people. So. The apostolic era is, era is that time after Christ when we're going out into the world and spreading the good news. And it really began, uh, for all intents and purposes, at Pentecost. So I want to set up a little bit about what Pentecost means. Now, a little, little history of myself. I am not Pentecostal, or I wasn't raised Pentecostal. Um, I was raised in a Presbyterian church, and I ran into these crazy Pentecostals. And I've been in Assemblies of God for about the past 20 years. Uh, but I started my time in a non-Pentecostal area, and we or a denomination. We kind of looked at Pentecostals with a lot of suspicion, because y'all were weird. Um, and, and I think a lot of you know that you're a little bit weird. Uh, but I've come to love that weirdness. Um, but there's something really important about Pentecost that, as a Presbyterian, we missed. And, and here's what it is. 
Pentecost really is the end of the curse of Babel in a lot of ways. You know the story of Babel, where a guy named Nimrod had a town. He was in, in, he was building in this town this big tower that was going to reach into the heavens. So he wasn't going to need to talk to God anymore. He'd just walk up a tower and get to it. And everyone had the same language. And God was like, you know what? If they can do this, there's nothing that will stop them. The problem wasn't that they were going to build a tower that could reach God. The problem was is that they were too arrogant in their, in their ability, and they were working together as a team, and they wouldn't need God anymore. So what God did is he confused their speech. He gave them all the different languages. And there, were, there was only one nation at that time. There was one people, one language. At Babel, though, everyone became fractured and separated, and there was a lot of disunity. There was a lot of dysfunction because of it, and there was fighting, and, and all that kind of stuff happened. Well, Pentecost, you know the story. Uh, the disciples are sitting there at Pentecost, and they're in this upper room, and as they're there eating together and fellowshipping, a wind blows in, and tongues of fire land on their heads, and they start speaking in other tongues. Essentially, they were all speaking in the same tongue. It was like Babel had been rescinded. Babel had been taken away, and all of a sudden, they were able to speak in languages. And it said that people out in the street could hear these guys talking, and they could hear the gospel in their own language. And they're like, what in the world is going on? Well, what was going on was God, God was sending the church out into the world. And he was doing it by saying, the curse that I put on Babel, I'm taking away for the purpose of evangelism. So Pentecost is really the beginning of the end of the curse of Babel. Um, under point two, uh, presenting the church to the festivals. And we're going to get back to Pentecost because that's the one we're getting to, but I'm going to take you through the festivals. The first one is Passover. Passover is the festival that remembers that God went over Egypt and the Israelites were supposed to put blood on their doorposts, going around their, their doors. So when God came over to take the, the firstborn, to kill the firstborn, he would pass over the Israelites. Well, the, the whole purpose for Passover, the whole purpose of the, uh, of the final plague, the death of the firstborn, was to take the Israelite people out of Egypt and put them on the path to going towards the promised land. So Passover, what it's about, is about being freed from our slavery, freed from our bondage, freed from what it, it traps us and enslaves us. So Passover is all about freedom, being set free. Uh, unleavened bread. So Passover is one night, right? It starts on a Sabbath. And then every day after that, for seven days, is a, is a day of unleavened bread. So the Jews would have the big the big meal on Passover, and they'd play the games, and they'd sing, and they'd have a good time. They, they'd finish everything they ate. Whatever they didn't eat, they would burn. And then they'd wake up in the morning, and they couldn't have anything leavened in the house for the next six days after that first day. And they would, they would basically be purifying themselves. So unleavened bread was all about being dedicated and about being clean, about basically starting all anew. So you're set free, and then you get all cleaned up, ready to go out into the world. Um, the, the third feast is first fruits. And what they would do is they would go out into the field, to the barley field where their grain was grown. And they would take ribbons, and they'd find the best of the barley that they could find out in the field. And the best stalks, the best looking stalks of grain, they would tie a little ribbon and tie it together in sheaves. And then when the grain grew and was completely you know, ready and, and, and the day of first fruits came, they would go out there and they would cut those sheaves that have the ribbons tied to them. And, and I, I, I'll never forget this. There was a pastor of a church that we were part of, and, and he had an illustration. He would get 10 $1 bills and call somebody up when he was teaching about tithing. And he would, he would count out 10 $1 bills and put them in a person's hand. And when he got all done, he said, now give me, the, what is the tithe? And the person would take the dollar bill off the top and hand him the dollar bill. He said, that's not your first dollar bill. Because what he what he was saying is you have to take the dollar bill off the bottom and hand it back to him. Because that was the first one that came in. And I don't understand it that way. So I, I had an illustration for the pastor. I got 10 brand new dollar bills. And I took nine of them, and I put honey on some, ketchup and mustard on others, and I crinkled them all up. I made them dirty and nasty. In the middle of those stack of 10 $1 bills, I had one that was completely clean and in perfect shape. And I, took, I went there and I counted out 10 $1 bills and I gave it to him. I said, now give me back the first fruit. And he said, this is my illustration. I said, I know. So he takes it off the bottom. And I said, I don't want that one. It's dirty. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, that's not the best one you got. I want the best $1 bill that you have in your hands. And he found the clean one. He pulled it out. First doesn't mean chronological. First is qualitative. or Yeah, qualitative. It's what is the best that you have. Right? 
So when, when God's asking for the first fruits of the barley, he doesn't want the first bit that grew up. He wants the best that just grew up. When he wants the first fruits of your effort, he doesn't want the first thing you do. He wants the best that you do. Uh, when he's asking for the first fruits of your labor, he wants you to give up something out of joy for it and give the, the best that you can give, whether it's your cash or whatever it is. He doesn't care about the order. He cares about how much you love it that you're giving to him. And when you, when you think about the, the story of Cain and Abel, where, uh, where Abel gave uh, choice bits of his flock, and then Cain gave what he had, well, Abel gave what he loved and what he cherished, and it hurt him to give it up, to give it to God. But he loved God so much, he was glad to do something that hurt. Whereas Cain just gave whatever he had, and just gave it to God. The whole idea is that we give God what we cherish, because we cherish God. Does that make sense? So that's what the first fruits are. And then you get the weeks, or Pentecost. So it's, it's called weeks because it's it's... So seven weeks after uh, Passover, um, that's when they do a couple things. Um, what the Jewish people would do after, at, at, the, at the Feast of Pentecost, um, a, a Feast of Weeks, they would go ahead and they would bake two uh, loaves that they used yeast for. And they carry the two loaves into the, the temple and put it on the table of showbread as an offering to God. It is the only time that a, that a sacrifice, an offering is ever made in the temple that has any kind of yeast involved. The only time ever in the offerings. Um, there's some questions about what the two loaves represent. Uh, one idea is one loaf is the Jews and one loaf is the Gentiles. Uh, one idea was one is the, 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 the priests and one is the nation of Israel. Uh, one, one person said it's the two tablets of the law we, rep we recognize, those two tablets. We don't really know why there's two. We just know that God says make, make bread with yeast and grain. Let it rise, bake it, and bring it in and put it on the, 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 show, the show table. Um, point, though, is that the loaves are leavened. And it means three things. Number one, that sin is in the camp. It means that even after they went through being freed from their slavery, even after they went through the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where they kept the house clean, they had no leavening, and even though they went through the first fruits and they got their best of their stuff and they brought it into the temple, even with all that, God's saying, I'm, I'm presenting the nation of Israel back, but I understand that the nation of Israel presented back is presented back with sin mixed in, that it never goes away. Um, similar to that B, that there's imperfection in the world. This side of, of Christ coming back and, and having a new creation, there is always going to be imperfection in the world. We're never going to have a perfect church. We're never going to have a perfect wife or a perfect husband or a perfect child or a perfect job. Uh, nothing that we have is going to be perfect. It's going to be enough for us, right? It's going to be something we're supposed to cherish and work with. But we have to understand that it's not going to be perfect. Uh, not until Christ comes back and makes it perfect. Um, and lastly, that God accepts us in our imperfection. Uh, in a very real sense, I think God actually picks us based on our imperfections. I think he picked Paul for his imperfections, and he wrote most of the New Testament. I think his imperfections was his pride, they believe. He had some sort of a thorn that it said that he wanted to be rid of. Uh, he had guilt because of all the people that he had presided over being executed. There were a lot of problems with Paul, but all that brewed, in, brewed into Paul, someone who was uh, able to be molded by God to do exactly what he had to do. And it gave him an opportunity through his training to present the gospel in ways that the rest of the disciples just were not equipped to do. So uh, the Feast of Weeks, that's presenting the church back is an imper imperfect thing. And last for tonight, I believe that's last, the beginning of the separation uh, between the Hebrew and the Christian. The first thing that we see in that, um, I don't have a lot of time, so we're going to try to get to the end of this. The first thing we see is Stephen. Uh, Stephen uh, was one of the, basically he was like a deacon in the church. Uh, in, the, in the Christian community, and uh, he was just filled with the Spirit. And uh, they, they basically brought him before the Sanhedrin to talk, and he gave one of the best sermons you'll ever hear. He gave the history of Israel, gave the, the history of Christ's uh, ministry, and then he gave the rebuke of Israel that they needed to hear. And they all went insane. And they dragged him out of the Sanhedrin, they took him outside the city, 
And while Paul is taking coats from people so they could throw rocks at him, they stone Stephen to death. And while he's being stoned, he sees heaven, heaven open up, and, and he talks about what he sees. It made him even madder than they were before, and Stephen was killed. But at that moment, from that point on, uh, the Sanhedrin and the Jewish nation that wanted to preserve their traditional way of life looked at Christianity and Christians as an enemy, uh, and they were going after them. Um, number two, the, dis the discipline of the way. Uh, there were certain things about what they called the way. That's what they called Christians at first. Christians weren't called Christians right off the bat. They were called followers of the way. And there were certain disciplines of that that were different than, than the Christian or than the uh, Jewish. Uh, one of those things was uh, they were really talking to a lot of Gentiles, which was unusual. And then when they're talking to the Gentiles, this caused a big problem. They weren't making all of them get um, uh, circumcised into the Christian or into the Jewish uh, tradition, and they weren't making them observe the, the uh, dietary laws and a lot of that stuff. So there were disciplines of the way that were different from the Jewish. So that began to happen. Um, and then they were drifting away from the Talmud. That was uh, basically the traditions. I'm, I'm going, going back to that. It's two different ways of saying the same thing. So from the beginning of Stephen, especially when uh, the Christians started evangelizing the, uh, the Gentiles, there was a separation between what the Christians held on to and what the Jewish people held on to. Um, point number four, the gospel to the Gentiles. Two of these things. Uh, number one, Peter's vision. I don't know if you're familiar with Peter's vision, uh, but that's the one where Peter was on a rooftop and uh, a sheet got lowered down and there were a bunch of unclean animals. And, and it comes down out of the sky and, and God says, kill and eat. And, and Peter says, I'm a, I'm a Jew. I'm not going to kill things uh, that I'm not supposed to. This happens three times. And what God says, what I've made uh, pure is pure. And, and some people view that as a license to go ahead and eat the unclean foods. Uh, that may be so. It may be that we can eat unclean foods. That's a different debate. But the vision wasn't about that. The vision was about the fact that God had made the Gentiles clean. That they didn't have to avoid being with the Gentiles and going and talking to them. So Peter's vision was a call by God to go out and evangelize the Gentiles and not look down on them. Uh, and then coming out of that was Paul's missionary journeys. He spent a lot of time in Greece. He spent a lot of time in Rome. He went all over uh, the Mediterranean area talking to the Gentiles. Now, he always went to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. But it seemed like he went to the Jews first so that he could go to the Gentiles. Um, so that's, the, that's really the beginning as we're going to start looking at this about how the Christian church now is splitting away from their Jewish heritage. And next week what we're going to talk about is, um, is the Council of um, Jerusalem. Uh, and, and that's a, a question that was, that was coming up because as Paul is going out and, and evangelizing the Gentiles, the Gentiles are being brought into the Christian faith. Uh, more and more of the Gentiles or more and more of the Israelites are saying, wait a minute, the Jews are saying, they're not circumcised. They're eating the wrong foods. They're not observing all the Sabbaths. They don't have tassels on their, their shirts. There's a bunch of things that they're doing wrong. And they had a council to find out what was it that the Jewish people or the Gentiles would have to observe if they came into the Christian faith. It's really important for us. And there's, there's a, there was a keen debate on it between uh, James and some of the, what they call the Judaizers. So next week, we're going to talk about um, the Council of Jerusalem. So if you're Reading ahead in the outline, that's where we're going. Uh, or you can go to the Book of Acts and look up the Council of Jerusalem. We're going to stop there. I'm going to remind you again uh, this evening, uh, there's not going to be a class for um, the five solas. Scott's not going to teach. I'm it. Uh, next week, Scott's going to be teaching the five solas, and I won't be here. Uh, if there's any questions, if you have any desire for the outline, uh, anything like that, I don't know. Scott, if you'll put the, the email up on the screen, uh, send an email to that email that's on the screen, and uh, we will reply to you, I hope. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you uh, next week, or Scott will. Um, peace be to you. Thank you.